Father, it's right and good to be still and know that you are God. That by your Holy Spirit, you dwell not only in our midst, but within the hearts and minds of every single soul you've saved by grace through faith in Christ. We've gathered here this morning, Father, desiring to commune with you, to hear from you, and to sing to you. We have no desire for religion. We know that we are sinners in need of grace even this day. And we know that you are a gracious God. And so we ask that you would bless us with your presence, that we might know you, that you might know us. I ask, Lord, that you would cause us to hear your word this morning, a word that you spoke through the prophets of old, a word that you confirmed in the presence of Peter and the apostles on the day of Pentecost, and a word that you continue to exercise this very hour as you pour out your spirit on many, saving them, calling them in, making them sons and daughters of your kingdom. Father, we ask that you would make Christ our vision this morning that in our heart of hearts we would see him as he truly is and be overwhelmed by his love and his majesty and his beauty and the grace and the mercy that he pours on us every hour. Cause us in your spirit to see him that we might worship you now. In your spirit and according to the truth of your word we ask these things. for your glory. In Christ's name, amen. Good morning. If you have a Bible, please open up to Joel chapter 2 if you're not already there with me. Joel chapter 2, the title of the sermon is Indwelling Spirit. And it is... Um, that's actually a good song to have on your phone, so good. <clears throat> this teaching is one that some of you will reject even though you know it's true. It is a teaching that is truly supernatural. And if you've been with us now for the past several weeks, we've been working through the minor prophet Joel, and we've been seeing this prevalent theme that God is pleased to bring himself glory in saving many through judgment, in bringing sinners saved by grace out of judgment to himself. He glorifies himself by revealing to mankind and all of creation his holiness and his goodness when he judges. And he glorifies himself before all creation by showing his mercy and his grace when he saves. Last week we had a chance to look at God not just saving, but the promise of restoration. That there would come a time, just as in the days of the locust of Joel, when God would restore their land, there will come a time when there would be a cosmic restoration. When God would come and he would make all things new in the heavens and on the earth. It is a prophecy so glorious and so over the top that some of you last week, I imagine, said, this is too good. It's too much. It's hard to believe. I'm thankful if that is your, your initial response because it, it means that you're getting a glimpse of how good it is, but you must press through that lack of faith because this is what the scriptures testify to, that God will in fulfillment of the prophecy, he will return to his people. He will dwell amongst his people. And he pr will provide provision and security and harmony between God and man and man in creation 
and it will be very, very good. What if, what if I told you that there's another blessing? What if I said that on top of last week's sermon, when God said, I will return to you, I will dwell amongst you, I will provide your security, your peace, your harmony, your food, your shelter, your joy. What if there's more to take you to the over-the-top of the over-the-top blessings? What if there's a blessing infinitely greater than anything I talked about last week? If you were raised in a home that celebrated Christmas, maybe your parents left that last gift to the very end. I mean, you opened up all the rest, right? You got, you got all the, the socks and the underwear for the year and that new pair of pajamas that you're just going to wear. But then there's that gift under the tree that is yet to be opened. And that's the one you really want. That's the one you asked for. And you're really hoping it's it. What if there's another blessing that not only guarantees your eternal joy, but the magnification and the glorification of God's name forever? That's the gift we want to open this morning. It's the one box that's still all wrapped up that we, by God's grace in this passage, will actually see and say, yes, amen, that is the best gift. Do you want to open it? <laughs> Good. So way back in the book of Numbers, embedded in Numbers, was a prayer slash prophecy by Moses. Most of us read right by it. Numbers eleven twenty nine. 29, listen. This simple prayer by Moses. He prays, would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. He said that in response to several were jealous of Moses. I mean, Moses was able to enter into the tent and Moses had direct dialogue with God. Moses knew God in an intimate and personal way. And those around him said, we want to know him like that too. We want to talk directly to God. We want to have a word from God. I want to know God in that Shekinah glory that Moses has. Intimacy. Relationship. This simple prayer by Moses is elaborated on here in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29 and testified to in Acts chapter 2 by the apostle Peter. God saying, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. I will do that. So I want to, by God's grace, try to get a handle on what this passage is saying about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God. I could not begin to talk about the impact, the magnitude, the purpose of the Holy Spirit in the church. So I'm just going to hit two from this passage. So this is not a, a sermon on pneumatology and the Spirit itself, but a couple things from this. I want to look at with your patience, one, the prophecy itself, this prophecy of old. Number two, the communion with God that this prophecy promises. And number three, the communication to the world that the prophecy mandates. The prophecy, the communion, and the communication. Number one, the prophecy of old. Look at the passage with me again, Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. The prophet said, And it shall come to pass afterward that I, God speaking, will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Verse 29, Even on the male and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit. This great historical movement of God sending His Holy Spirit, the third person of the Holy Triune God, to earth in those days. In what days? In what days? What time period is God talking about? You know, some prophecies in the Old and even the New Testament, they're very difficult to try to hone in on a time. This is not one. 
We know exactly the time that God was speaking of here through the prophet Joel because it's answered in Acts chapter 2. Before Jesus ascended into heaven, if you remember, he ordered the disciples to stay in Jerusalem and wait for what? For the promise of the Father. He says, do not leave because I'm going to send the helper. I'm going to send the Spirit. Let me read to you Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, the disciples were all together in one place. Listen. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled. Listen. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They had all become prophets, just like Moses. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing the disciples speak in his own language. They were hearing the disciples speak in the language from the nation in which they came. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language about, listen, the mighty works of God? And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? What does this mean? Peter answers them by quoting Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, the very passage that we're looking at today. Listen, the answer to, jo to Moses' prayer, the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy, the promise that Jesus made that he would send the helper was answered on the day of Pentecost when God sp spilled out, overpoured the Holy Spirit upon his people. Jesus said in John 14, 26, upon my ascension, listen, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. John 16, 7, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. If I go, he said, I will send him to you. These days, those days that Joel was talking about, this time in history from the day of Pentecost until Christ comes again in glory, these are the last days right now. Which means, my beloved, that these are the days of the Spirit being poured out by the living God right now. I want you to look at verse 23. Bump back a little bit. This is poetry. So God has laid the groundwork for this. In verse 23, he was talking about pouring down the rain on a parched land. Verse 23, be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. He has poured down for you abundant rain, a deluge of rain. And then a few verses later, he reveals to them that he's going to pour down He's going to gush out a cascading of the Holy Spirit himself without measure on all flesh. In other words, he's saying my, my spirit will overflow in the hearts and minds of those I save by grace. He said, well, what spirit is this? This is the Holy Spirit of the Holy Triune God, fully God. This is the same spirit that moved over the darkness and the void and brought order out of chaos in Genesis chapter 1. This is the same spirit that was poured out upon Joshua in Deuteronomy 34, enabling Joshua to lead God's people into the promised land. This is the same spirit that came upon Gideon, enabling him with 300 men to conquer 135,000 Midianites and Amalekites in a single day. This is the same spirit poured out on David that enabled him to defeat his enemies and rule over the nation. This is the same spirit, my beloved, that descended upon our Lord Jesus Christ on the day he was baptized in the Jordan. 
the same spirit that enabled our Lord to live a ministry, a gospel ministry that took him to the cross to descend and receive the full punishment of our sins in his beautiful body. Joel is saying that these are the last days, and in these days, he's pouring out that same spirit on you. Same spirit of God in these days being poured out on his church. In the Old Testament, the the Holy Spirit being poured out was restricted to certain leaders and certain prophets, but not in these days, not in the last days, not from the day of Pentecost until Christ comes again. Look at it again at the passage. Your sons and your daughters, your old men and your young men, even male and female servants will receive the Spirit of God. Every economic, social, and academic background, every tribe, every tongue, and every nation that repented and believed in Christ would receive this most blessed gift It is God. It is the Holy Spirit of God coming and dwelling in the hearts and minds of his people. This is the prophecy. And the evidence is the supernatural events that attended it. There was prophecy. There were dreams and there were visions. Ecstatic experiences. At Pentecost, it was the speaking of tongues. This, my beloved, validated the Holy Spirit's coming to dwell supernaturally in his church, to reside fully and powerfully without distinction of class or race or language or upbringing in his people. That's the prophecy. If you are bored, you have no idea what I just said. If this is true, It is, again, it's over the top of being over the top. I want to keep this as tight as I can in this passage. What does that mean for us? If the Holy Spirit has truly been poured out and now dwells in God's people, we are now his temple. What are the implications for the church? I believe that there are two from this passage. One is communion with God, and number two, communication of God to the world. Communion and communication. So point number two, I pray you're still with me. I know there's a bit of high theology on this when we talk about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but it is as radically practical as theology gets. God living in you right now, day in and day out. So... Why is God doing this? Number one, because he wants to commune with us. I mean, he, he really wants to commune with his people. The apex of the restoration that God is going to bring to the broken world is his dwelling in our midst, in us. Look at verse 27 again. This was the promise from last week. This is where we left off. God saying to the people in Joel's day, you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and there is none else. Of all the promises, this is the best one. Of the hope of the vineyards coming back and the animals thriving and families receiving joy again, this is the apex, the ultimate promise. Because, listen, Without the promise of God's presence in our lives, everything else becomes irrelevant. If God is not going to commune with his people, then he can provide all the wine and all the grain offering and all the, 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 uh, the animals and the prosperity and family life, but it is nothing short of hell if God is not with us. Amen. After one of their many rebellions in the desert against God, God had determined that he was going to send the Israelites and Moses into the promised land, but he said, I'm not going with you. Moses cried out to God in in prayer. Listen to what he asks in Exodus 33. He says, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. Moses saying, if you're not going to come in, then leave us to die in the desert. He said, for how shall it be known 
that I and your people have found favor in your sight? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct from every other tribe on the face of the earth? Moses understood and the people understood that it was God who gave them their identity. It was God who gave them their purpose in life. It was God who gave them their joy in life. It was his presence in their midst that brought that deep satisfaction that the human heart so desperately longs for, that deep sense of peace and joy because you and God are one. Communion with him. If God would not go, they said, then let us die. If God will not enter the promised land with us, then let us remain here and die. And I would say, my beloved, that if that statement sounds extreme to you, then you have not tasted and seen the glory and majesty of God. You haven't tasted him yet. You're still satisfied with those presents that came out first. You're still sitting there on the couch licking your candy cane when the unopened gift is underneath the tree. You don't know how good the Lord is if you think an eternity of security and harmony and blessings of food and shelter without God is good. That is hell. You don't know how good he is and you don't know the type of relationship that he's talking about here. This is not just God dwelling in our midst, walking amongst us, talking to us. This prophecy the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, what God is doing even this hour is God saying, I, through my Holy Spirit, am going to come inside of you. I'm going to get inside of you. Ezekiel, centuries before Pentecost, told us this exact prophecy. Ezekiel 36, God said, I will vindicate the holiness of my great name. Isn't that great? I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations. How is God going to do that? How is God going to make his name great amongst nations who have profaned it? He says, I will give you the church a new heart, a new spirit I will put within you. Listen to this. I will put my spirit, the Holy Spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. This was the plan of glory. From the very beginning, this was God's ordained plan to vindicate his name and glorify his name by having the Holy Spirit dwell inside his people. A communion more intimate and more personal than you at this point in time as sinful people saved by grace in the flesh can possibly imagine. Think of the greatest relationship you've ever had. Children with your parents, husband with a wife, friend with a friend. He said, it cannot get any sweeter. It cannot be any better. We know each other's thoughts. We finish each other's sentences. This person knows me, and I know them. You're not even close to what this prophecy is talking about. This is God in you. Paul asked this rhetorical question of the church in Corinth. This has been an accepted prophecy and teaching in the history of God's people. 1 Corinthians 3.16, Paul said, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Do you not know that, church? He says it again a few chapters later, 1 Corinthians 6.19, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? To the church in Rome, Paul says, Romans 8.9, You are in the flesh you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed what? The spirit of God dwells in you. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Do not for a minute hear that phrase and turn it into Christian ease as something of a sentimental value or a biblical metaphor for power or for intimacy or for spirituality. This is an objective prophetic fact that those who have been saved by grace have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of them. It is the blessing. It is the greatest blessing of the restoration of a broken heaven and earth that God the Father, 
through the saving work of Jesus Christ, would send his Holy Spirit to bind us to him. To bring us in intimately, inseparably, both now and forever. Paul said in Ephesians 1:13. In him you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Until all those things happen, the security, the peace, the prosperity, until all that happens, God says, I'm going to send my Holy Spirit as a guarantee of it. And if we had any sense, we said, it's sufficient. He's sufficient. If the Holy Spirit dwells in me, therefore I know Christ, and therefore I know the Father, then come what may, it is sufficient. He does this because he wants you to really know him. Hmm? I mean, really know him. John 16, 13. Jesus said, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. All truth. Truth about who God is. Truth about who we are. Truth about our desperate need to be saved by grace through faith in Christ. Truth of this Holy Spirit dwelling in us, sanctifying us, making us holy, and one day bringing us into the presence of God the Father that we might be glorified, holy, without sin in his presence. Another prophecy of old, not a new teaching. Jeremiah 31, this is the covenant, God said, I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. Listen, I will put my law in their minds and write it upon their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. Why? Because Christ dwells in us through the Spirit. The young and the old, the sons and daughters, the masters and servants, God says, you'll all know me. You'll all know me. Not know about me, but know me. You'll know my likes and my dislikes. You'll know my voice. You'll know my character. You'll know my will, my law, my desires. You'll know me. The Holy Spirit enables us to know God. And God knows us. Completely. And as a result, he cultivates us this deep desire because of our knowledge of God to live these holy lives out of great joy. Again, Paul said in Ephesians 3.16, a prayer, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit where? In your inner being. Christianity is not religion. Religion is outside in. It's trying to put God in our debt by doing good things. Christianity is inside out. It's the Holy Spirit dwelling in you and changing you so radically that you want to submit to God. You want to know the laws and you want to follow him with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul. It's enabling you and me and every sinner saved by grace to know God because that knowledge cultivates obedience and joy. Here, simple rule. The more you know God, the more you'll want to obey. The more you know God, the more you want to walk in the light, by faith, in the spirit, not in the darkness, not by your flesh, the more you know God. One of the great secrets that many still misunderstand the church is how Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. We make this theological mistake. Now listen, some will say, well, he obviously lived a perfect life because he was fully human, he was fully God. And as fully God, he not only could not sin, he couldn't be tempted by sin. He was fully God and fully man. And as fully man, listen, he was tempted. Do not take the temptation of our Lord in the desert by Satan as not real. He was tempted. He was tempted to eat because he was famished. He was tempted to have bowed down that he might receive the kingdom without going through the cross. 
Do not think for a minute that when he was praying to God, the Father in the garden, for the cup to pass, that he was not tempted to vacate that place. For 33 years, Jesus Christ, fully man, sojourned on this earth, tempted, but he never sinned. He never sinned, not because he was fully God. He never sinned, listen, because the Holy Spirit dwelt within him. And it was his desire, it was his desire to know God the Father and know the Spirit so intimately that nothing would come in the way. Jesus Christ lived a sinless life because it was his greatest desire to have a right relationship in love and intimacy with God the Father. In other words, he didn't sin because he knew God. And because he knew God, he didn't want to sin. That's simple enough, right? He didn't sin because he knew God, and because he knew God, he didn't want to sin. Do you want to stop sinning? Know God. Most of you who remember your Revolutionary War history, George Washington, General George Washington, he faced quite a daunting task taking on the largest military in the world at the time. He had short-term enlistments in the military, limited supplies. They were poorly dressed, poorly equipped, and poorly trained. Reluctant congregational and state legislators, short on funds, wavering loyalty to the glorious cause of freedom. And yet, and listen, there were enough soldiers and enough civilians to stay the course behind this man because as one historian so well put it, listen, they trusted him, they believed in him, they loved him, they knew him. They knew him. And they said, we know this man, we love this man, and so they followed him into revolution. If you're in Christ and the Holy Spirit dwells in you. And if the Holy Spirit dwells in you, then you know God. And your desire should be the same, to fight against the temptation of the flesh, to fight against sin, that you might walk in the Spirit. You have power, my beloved. I've heard too many believers over the years say, I can't overcome that sin. That is a lie. You have power. The same power that Jesus Christ had as a man to live a sinless life dwells in you. Same power, same spirit. He hasn't changed. He's not less powerful today than he was in the time of Christ. He didn't pour out anything less on you than he did pour out on Gideon or David or Joshua or Moses. Same outpouring, same spirit. And therefore, my beloved, we are without excuse Every time we sin, Paul was right when he said in 1 Corinthians 10, no temptation, not one, has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, listen, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure under it. The Holy Spirit residing in you every moment of every day so that every time you're tempted, he is saying, this way. Here's the out. Here's the safe place. Here's the narrow road. There's the light. You do not lack power in the Holy Spirit of God. That means, my beloved, every single sin that you struggle with at this very moment Every sin that you've struggled with for months or years, those sins that we call the besetting sins, the ones we just can't get rid of, we get a reprieve for a time, and then it comes back, and we're ensnared, and we're stumbling again. The Holy Spirit has the power to overcome it. This hour, you lack nothing. You lack no power. So if you're fighting this morning the sin of gluttony or the sin of lust, or the sin of covetousness, the Spirit can overcome. Ability to overcome. If this morning you are dealing with pride, 
or maybe that deep sense of insecurity, or maybe anxiety that comes upon you in the wee hours of the morning, the Spirit can overcome. Maybe you are struggling with a, a, a feverish pursuit of leisure or convenience, or success. Maybe that has ensnared you. The spirit of the living God dwelling in you can overcome. Now, you say, well, of course. Well, answer like Martha. Of course he will overcome on that great day of glory when he makes me. No, he can overcome now. We are without excuse. It is not a lack of power residing in you. In fact, God, God is so pleased with this plan of redemption of having his spirit dwell in you, he has purposed that the spirit of God will dwell in us forever. Forever. God did not pour out his Holy Spirit at Pentecost to come as a stopgap measure to get the church from conversion to glorification, right? You only have the Holy Spirit temporarily just to get us into the presence of God. That's not the plan. The plan is the Holy Spirit dwelling in you forever. That you will come into the presence of God and all sin will be removed and you will have, listen, you will have a perfect relationship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit dwells in you. Perfect. No barrier, no obstruction, no problems, no rebellion. And that means, my beloved, and here's the over the top of the over the top of the over the top. Here's the bigger present under the tree. It means, this is so mind-boggling to me, that the plan for the church, you, me, all who have been saved by grace for centuries, the Holy Spirit dwelling in us that we might come into the Holy Triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and the church exchanging and receiving glory, love, intimacy, joy, satisfaction indescribable is what we're called into. The same glory that's being, has been exchanged amongst the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from eternity past, the same glory that will be exchanged for eternity future, now you are in that. You participate in that. You sing the glory and you praise the glory of God and he pours it right back on you because the Holy Spirit dwells in you. You are not God, but you are redeemed into his presence and he dwells in you. It is the consummation of the restoration. It is the pinnacle of pinnacles for mankind. If we had any sense about ourselves, we would say, well, this obviously is the gift that I want to open. It is the Holy Spirit indwelling me now and forever. Because I'm sure this is be better than that bicycle that I wanted. And I'm sure it's better than that Nintendo game. It has to be. It has to be. Perfect communion with God. Perfect intimacy. Perfect expressions of love and affection. Perfect. Forever. Why? Why? because you'll know God. You will know him, he will know you, and there will be no more sin. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 17, this is eternal life, knowing God the Father and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. I could stop now, could I not? This is sufficient. This is sufficient. But if I did, I'd be neglecting the text because there is an imperative that comes from this. I mean, if this should have caused you, if you've never heard this teaching before, to rejoice so deeply in your seat that you said, I gotta, uh, we gotta go back to another song, Pastor. We need to sing, because I need to lift my voice up to this most glorious God. And we will sing again in a few. But I gotta get you to the third, because there is an imperative that comes from this. Point number three, the communication of this glorious God to the world. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, before the Holy Spirit had been poured out, Jesus said to his disciples before his ascension, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, 
and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and where? To the ends of the earth. Now when our Lord said this, they certainly did not understand that in a matter of days, Pentecost was going to happen. They didn't get that the Holy Spirit was going to come and indwell them. Look with me again at the passage. The prophecy fulfilled. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. Prophecy, dreams, visions, supernatural, ecstatic revelation. For what purpose? Boy, I don't want us to miss this. What was the purpose of these supernatural prophecies and dreams and visions? It was to announce the Holy Spirit has come, that he's here, that God, through the Holy Spirit, was not only making himself known, but he was making himself accessible to all flesh through the work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. God was going to make himself known. That was the promise. Verse 27, again, it's central to the text. You shall know, God said, that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and there is none else. Jesus Christ is described in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 as the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Jesus Christ came in the flesh to make God the Father known. And now... The Holy Spirit has come to dwell in our flesh. To do what? <laughs> to make God the Father known. The mission continues. It, didn't end, it did not end with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was just the beginning. As Jesus Christ in the flesh makes the Father known. So we, the church, with the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, in our flesh, we are to make God the Father known. So often, this passage and others like it are misinterpreted by our charismatic and Pentecostal brothers and sisters in Christ. They get focused on the prophecy and the dreams and the vision, the ecstatic experience, and what they miss is the person and the message. The person is the Holy Spirit. The message is Jesus Christ. The prophecies and visions and dreams are not an end in and of themselves. They are a sign that the Spirit has come and it tells the church, open your mouths and let everybody know. Tell everybody about God the Father and the work of Jesus Christ the Son and the Holy Spirit that now dwells in you these last days. The Spirit comes to dwell in us that we might commune with God the Spirit comes to dwell in us that we, the church in the flesh, might make known to the world the glory of God. That we might communicate with our lives and with our lips these over-the-top truths. The Spirit came to a dying world to let the world know the kingdom of God is at hand. The Spirit came, John 16, 18, to convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. The Spirit came to say, judgment is upon us and judgment is coming, but you can be saved in Christ. The Spirit came to point man to repentance and grace and faith that we might be saved. It wasn't the prophecy, it wasn't the tongues, it was not the dreams and the visions, it is the Holy Spirit and the message of the gospel of grace. What happened? What happened after the Spirit descended upon the, the apostles on Pentecost? What did Peter do after the, the gift of tongues was expressed and heard? He preached. And what did he preach? He preached the gospel of grace. And what did people do? 3,000 that day, they heard and they repented and they believed. That means for us two salient things, and then I'll close. Number one, the Holy Spirit establishes the preeminence of God's Word. 
the absolute supremacy of the prophetic word of God in the Bible. Peter quoted Joel because he understood that their ability to speak in tongues and the ability of those present to hear in tongues and receive the message and be saved, he got that this was the overturning of Babel. Right? You remember what happened at Babel. All the people speaking in one language were building a tower into the heavens. So what? So they could make a name for themselves. And God says, I will have none of that. And so he destroyed the, t the tower. He confused their languages and he dispersed them across the face of the earth. And you know what happens at Pentecost? It's an overcoming of the curse of Babel. What is happening at Pentecost? They are speaking in tongues. Everybody's hearing the same language, but infinitely more important, God is making for himself a people, once again, one people unified under the banner of Jesus Christ. For what purpose? Not to make a name for themselves, not a name for the church, but a name for God. Babel overcome by the coming of the Holy Spirit. And that means, my beloved, that the word that we have, the word that we need, is here by God's grace. We have an Old and a New Testament that we call a closed canon. God has spoken, and that's why we believe it to be authoritative and infallible and inerrant and divinely inspired. We believe, Paul, when he said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, that all Scripture is God-breathed out and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The gift of prophecy in the apostolic age was codified for us here in the perfect word of God that we might proclaim it too. That's why when you come here on Sunday, you hear us reading from the Word of God. That's why if you're listening as you sing, you're thinking, oh, that's from the Word of God. That's why when we pray, we pray from the Word of God. That's why when I preach, I preach from the Word of God. This is the prophetic Word. We don't need the prophecies or the dreams or the visions. We have God's Word. And it means that it has the same power to be uttered from our lips, to go out to the world that people who are dead can be made alive, they can hear the gospel, and they too can repent of their sins, they too can trust in Jesus Christ, and they too can live with the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. God has spoken. His word is complete. We have it by his grace in our midst. And that also means one other thing. It means that you are a prophet. Now listen closely. I don't want you getting weird on me. You are a prophet in the New Testament sense. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit in you, being poured out on all flesh, the young and the old, the servants and the masters. You have the Word of God. So the Holy Spirit dwells in you and you have the Word of God. That makes you a prophet. Every Christian, young and old, sons and daughters, masters and servants, have therefore a prophetic role to play. Let me read to you again, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. If you know Christ, that has happened to you. Correct? And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Who was he speaking to? He said he was talking to the prophets, the apostles, the disciples. How far did they get? Well, how far did they get? They, they got in to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the surrounding region. We know that Paul got into Europe. I, I, that's not the ends of the world. They didn't get to China. Not to Brazil, not to the United States. Who was Jesus speaking of that we would be the witnesses to the ends of the earth? He was speaking of you. He was speaking of his church. You said, why would he tell me to do that? Because the Holy Spirit dwells in you and you have his word. You are a prophet. We are prophets. Not of our own prophecy, not of our own words 
but God's word spoken with God's spirit that dwells in us. First Peter chapter two, verse five, Peter said, you yourselves are like living stones being built up as a spiritual house, the church of God, to be what? Listen to this, a holy priesthood. A holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. My beloved, there is no greater spiritual sacrifice that you have to offer to God than to bring the gospel of grace to a lost world. You, prophets and priests, taking God's word to the world that does not know God. But that is the problem, right? They don't glorify God because they do not know God. And they do not know God because they have not heard the gospel message. But what hope you have, prophets of God, with God's word and the spirit dwelling in you? You can go to them and you can tell them about God. You can tell them about how he is holy and powerful and good and that he will, as Joel said, he will come and he will judge. And you can say, but that's not the whole story. This God is so good and so gracious that he sent Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, to die on a cross for the sins of all who repent and believe and trust in him. And those who do, they'll be redeemed. They'll be brought in. They will not be cast out on the day of judgment, that they will become sons and daughters with the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. Oh my, do you have a message to share? What a message you, prophets of God, have to share. You can go to the world with your lips because the Holy Spirit dwells in you and convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. That was the role described by Christ of the Holy Spirit. Well, how does he do that? Through the church because he dwells in you. You can tell people of the great hope to come. You can tell people that this God brings himself glory by saving many out of the great judgment, saving many out. You can tell them of how he's going to one day restore the heavens and the earth. You can talk to them about the blessings of security and peace and harmony and plenty. Tell them about that, but don't miss the big present. Don't neglect to tell them that the ultimate consummate blessing is their ability in Christ to have God inside of them, to have a relationship with the creator, unlike any relationship they have ever known or ever will know. You can tell them to put down their silly little candy canes and to open up the big box because that's the one they want. That's the one their heart longs for most. They don't know it. They keep trying to open it up in their workplace or with their children or their grandchildren or where they live or the vacations they take. They don't get it. That's not the box. The box is Christ. The promise is the Holy Spirit dwelling in you forever. And the end, which never ends, is you, my beloved, God's church, in the presence of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, glorifying him forever. That is the glorious end that never ends. I'm going to pray that God helps us see clearly that we are all prophets and that we all have a word and that by God's grace we'll open our mouths. Amen? Let's pray. Father, it is grievous how quiet we are as a people. We have, we have your word. We need not wait for prophecies or dreams or visions. We have your word. Through Christ, you have poured out abundantly the Holy Spirit to come and dwell inside of us captivating our hearts and minds. We have power. We have your word. 
Lord, why are we so quiet? We live amongst the people that are dying. We have power and we have your word. Why don't we tell them? We have family members, close friends. We have people we sit next to every day for years on end that do not know you. We have your power and we have your word. Why don't we tell them? Why don't we tell them of the hope they can have in Christ? Why don't we tell them of that glorious gift under the tree that is the indwelling of your Holy Spirit? Father, forgive us for our silence, I pray. It is sinful. And be gracious to loosen our tongues and open our mouths and let us be a brilliant, humble testimony to this fallen world. For my brothers and sisters in the workplace, I pray that would become their mission field. They would look upon their colleagues as those that are made in your image, that will spend all of eternity in a heaven or a hell. Help them see that, Father, they might speak boldly. I pray that we would not have another family gathering around a dinner table with lost souls who have never heard the gospel, that you would open our mouths, Lord, and we would testify to these great truths. I pray, Father, that we would see our neighbors and the acquaintances as people who've never heard of Christ, and then we tell them. By your spirit and your power, I pray you would do these great things here in this place, and not just here in Cambrian Park, I pray, Lord, that all true churches throughout the world, here in the South Bay, in San Jose, in this country, and to the far reaches of the earth, you would open our mouths, loosen our tongues to share this truth. If we know it, it is too glorious to keep inside. We ask, Lord, that you would do this work here and throughout the world for the purpose of your glory that you would magnify your name through your church. We ask it all in the name of our lovely Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.